Hello, I'm Herman Eberhardt, Supervisory Museum Curator at the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum. Back again to talk about the stories connected to interesting and unusual items in the museum collection. This program is premiering on January 20th, 2021, Inauguration Day. And to mark the occasion, we're going to take a look at a selection of artifacts, photos, audio, and film connected to Franklin Roosevelt's presidential inaugurals. President Roosevelt, of course, is unique in being the only person ever elected and inaugurated as president four times. After the 22nd Amendment to the Constitution was ratified in 1951, our presidents have been limited to just two terms in office. With four different FDR inaugurals to review, we have a lot of ground to cover in this program. So let's get started. FDR's first inaugural took place on March 4th, 1933. Here's a ticket for one of the VIP sections at that inaugural. As you can see, the date there, March 4th, 1933, is down there on the lower right side of the ticket. Here's the back side of the ticket. As you can see, it's very colorful and includes portraits of FDR and his vice president, John Nance Garner. And between them, there's a rising sun labeled 1933. It's clearly meant to symbolize not only the start of a new presidential administration, but also, hopefully, the dawn of better times for the nation. Now, a question some of you may be asking right now is, why did FDR take office on March 4th? Shouldn't his inauguration have occurred on January 20th? Well, up until 1937, March 4th was the date when presidential inaugurations were scheduled to take place. Now, why was that specific date selected? Well, that was the date in 1789 when the federal government began operating under the new United States Constitution. Inaugurating the president so long after election day made sense in the early years of our nation. Back in those days, an extended period of time was needed to gather the election returns and for the president-elect to settle his affairs and travel with his family by horse and carriage to the nation's capital. However, by the 1930s, vast improvements in communication and transportation networks made it possible and preferable to shorten the time gap between election day and inauguration day. So in 1933, Americans ratified the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. That amendment moved the inauguration date up to January 20th. And in 1937, FDR's second presidential inaugural would take place on this new date. Now, getting back to 1933, FDR's day began on March 4th, 1933, when he and Eleanor Roosevelt traveled by car to the White House to meet outgoing President Herbert Hoover and First Lady Lou Hoover. The president and the president-elect then rode together in an open car to the Capitol building for the inaugural ceremonies. I should note here that FDR and President Hoover were on pretty poor terms at this point, and during the ride, Hoover said almost nothing while FDR tried to make small talk and wave to the crowds lining Pennsylvania Avenue. This photo captures the strained mood between them pretty well. And in fact, we know that these two men would never meet again after March 4th, 1933. Now, over at the Capitol building, if you were among the ticketed guests in the VIP sections, you might be wearing a ceremonial badge like the one on the left. This particular badge was issued to honored guests representing the state of Massachusetts at the inaugural. If instead you were among the many thousands of everyday Americans in the large crowds along Pennsylvania Avenue and outside the Capitol building, you could always buy a commemorative souvenir from a street vendor like this colorful pin, which depicts the president-elect in front of the Capitol building. Now, shortly before noon, FDR walked slowly out to the east front of the Capitol building to take the oath of office. Here you see him standing at the rostrum that was set up for the occasion. Every president has a choice of which Bible to use for the official swearing-in ceremony. In FDR's case, he selected a Roosevelt family Bible, which his Dutch ancestors had brought over from Europe when they emigrated to North America in the 17th century. Here you see FDR posing for photographers as he examines that historic Bible at the Roosevelt home here in Hyde Park, weeks before the inaugural. This Bible was printed in Amsterdam in 1686 and is the oldest of the known inaugural Bibles used by America's presidents. It's also the only one in a modern foreign language since it was printed in Dutch. FDR used this Bible to take the oath of office at all four of his presidential inaugurations. 
And visitors to our museum are able to see this historic Bible in our gallery dealing with FDR's first inauguration. Now the clerk who held the Bible while FDR took the oath of office was instructed to hold it open to a specific passage selected by the president elect. That passage is a verse in St. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians that reads, quote, and now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity, end quote. FDR's first inaugural took place at the low point of the Great Depression. On March 4, 1933, the nation's unemployment rate was a staggering 25%. Millions of people had lost their life savings when banks collapsed and shut their doors. The country was in a state of fear. And in his inaugural address, FDR directly referenced that fear in words that have become renowned in our history. Let's watch and listen to a short portion of the speech. This video clip runs about 45 seconds. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed effort to convert retreat into advance. In every dark hour of our national life, a leadership of frankness and of vigor has met with that understanding and support of the people themselves, which is essential to victory. And I am convinced that you will again give that support to leadership in these critical days. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Those words are arguably the most famous that FDR ever uttered. And certainly, they are the single thing we most associate with his first inaugural in 1933. Now let's jump forward four years in time to 1937 and FDR's second inaugural. Here is one of the elaborate formal invitations to that inaugural that went out to honored guests prior to the ceremony. The 1937 inaugural came after President Roosevelt's historic landslide re-election in 1936. FDR won over 60% of the vote that year, carrying every state in the nation except Maine and Vermont. So FDR really was the man of the hour on January 20th, 1937, as this commemorative button pro proclaims. Economic conditions in 1937 were far better than they had been in 1933, though the nation was still struggling to shake off the grip of the Great Depression. The country's renewed sense of optimism is reflected in the official tickets that were issued for the 1937 inaugural. You'll recall that the ticket I showed you earlier from the 1933 inaugural featured a rising sun. In contrast, the 1937 inaugural ticket depicts the sun at midday, shining over humming factories and productive farms. Another interesting thing to note about this ticket is the printed message on the right. As I noted earlier, the 1937 inaugural was the first to be held on January 20th, and the inaugural ticket acknowledges this historic date change. It reads in part, quote, it is suggested that the larger portion of this ticket be retained as a souvenir of the first inaugural ever to be held on January 20th. Now, unfortunately for President Roosevelt and the crowd that gathered for his second inaugural, January 20th, 1937 was an extremely rainy and blustery day. Note the open umbrellas behind FDR as he delivers his inaugural address, and the tarp covering the ceremonial eagle plaque in front of the president. Over an inch and a half of rain fell on Washington, D.C. that day, and with temperatures hovering in the low 30s, the rain turned to sleet at times. Still, FDR soldiered on with his inaugural address. In that speech, he pointed out the important economic progress the nation had made during the past four years, but he also pledged to expand his administration's efforts to address the needs of millions of America's neediest citizens. Let's listen to a portion of the speech. This audio excerpt runs for about a minute and a half. I see a great nation upon a great continent, blessed with a great wealth of national resources. Its 130 million people are at peace among themselves. They are making their country a good neighbor among the nations. But here is the challenge to our democracy. In this nation, I see tens of millions of its citizens 
a substantial part of its whole population who at this very moment are denied the greater part of what the very lowest standards of today call the necessities of life. I see millions of families trying to live on income so meager that the fall of family disaster hangs over them day by day. I see one third of a nation ill housed, ill clad, ill nourished. But it is not in despair that I paint that picture for you. I paint it for you in hope because the nation, seeing and understanding the injustice of it, proposes to paint it out. We are determined to make every American citizen the subject of his country's interests and concerns. And we will never regard any faithful law-abiding group within our borders as superfluous. The test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. FDR's second inaugural address is among his most famous and frequently quoted speeches. In fact, one of the sentences you just heard the president speak is the quotation that greets visitors to our museum here in Hyde Park. You can see the quote just above FDR's portrait in our entry lobby. It reads, quote, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much. It is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. Well, as we've seen, FDR's second inaugural in 1937 was an historic one, being the first ever held on January 20th. But his third inaugural on January 20th, 1941, was even more historic. For this was the first and only time that a president has taken the oath of office for a third term. In this photo, FDR and First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt wave to the crowd as they prepare to drive from the White House to the Capitol building for the inaugural ceremonies. And here are some examples of commemorative souvenirs that you might have purchased from a street vendor if you were among the thousands of people who gathered in Washington, D.C. for the inaugural that day. These kinds of items are always popular sale items at modern presidential inaugurals. Of course, only a select group of people would get formal tickets like this one to the historic ceremony. There are a couple of interesting details on the backside of this ticket that I want to point out. First, we can see that FDR had a new vice president in 1941. John Nance Garner, FDR's vice president during his first two terms, has been replaced by Henry A. Wallace. Wallace had previously served in FDR's cabinet as Secretary of Agriculture. Another interesting detail is the globe pictured between FDR and Wallace. Notice that it depicts North and South America. In January 1941, World War II was raging across the globe. And while the United States was not yet directly involved in that conflict, President Roosevelt was providing vital support to the British in their fight against the Axis powers. The president was also a strong advocate for increased American defense spending and Western hemispheric defense. I think the inclusion of this globe on the ticket for his 1941 inaugural was intended to symbolize the growing international concerns and focus of the Roosevelt administration at this critical moment in world history. Now, before we leave FDR's third inaugural, I want to mention one other interesting point. Those of you who have some familiarity with the Capitol building may have noticed that President Roosevelt's first, second, and third inaugurals all took place on the east side of that building. This was traditionally the side of the building used for inaugurations. However, that changed in 1981 when Ronald Reagan held his first inaugural on the building's western side, the side that faces the Washington Mall. This provided a much more dramatic setting and allowed for a much larger crowd. All subsequent presidents have agreed with President Reagan's decision and held their inaugurals on the west side of the Capitol as well. So now we've come to FDR's fourth and final inaugural. It took place on January 20th, 1945. With bloody wartime battles underway in both Europe and Asia, FDR felt that this inauguration should be a scaled down affair with no pomp, parades, and other fanfare. 
In addition, the ceremony was held at the White House instead of the Capitol building. Here you can see the relatively small crowd that gathered on the South Lawn of the White House to see the president and his new vice president, Harry S. Truman, take the oath of office on the South Portico. In this close-up shot, we can see President Roosevelt taking the oath of office for the fourth and final time. And here he shakes hands with Vice President Truman before turning to the crowd to deliver his inaugural address. This speech would be the shortest of FDR's four inaugural addresses. It totaled just 561 words and took him less than six minutes to deliver. Yet it was an eloquent appeal for Americans to abandon their long tradition of isolationism and become, in his words, citizens of the world. The president believed the only way to ensure a peaceful post-war world was for the United States to become more engaged in international affairs, including taking a large role in the United Nations organization that was just beginning to take shape under FDR's prodding. Let's listen to a brief excerpt from the president's speech where he touches on this theme of internationalism. This audio clip runs about a minute and a half. My friend, you will understand and I believe agree with my wish that the form of this inauguration be simple and its words brief. We Americans of today, together with our allies, are passing through a period of supreme test. It is a test of our courage, of our resolve, of our wisdom, of our essential democracy. In the days and the years that are to come, we shall work for a just and honorable peace, a durable peace, as today we work and fight for a total victory in war. We can and we will achieve such a peace. And so today, in this year of war, 1945, we have learned lessons at a fearful cost, and we shall profit by them. We have learned that we cannot live alone. We have learned we, that we must live as men and not as ostriches, nor as dogs in the manger. We have learned to be citizens of the world members of the human community. As you just heard there, President Roosevelt delivered his speech in a clear and forceful voice. However, observers at the inaugural were struck by his gaunt appearance. In fact, FDR was suffering from advanced heart disease. And indeed, one of the unspoken reasons for holding the inaugural ceremony at the White House was that the president was too worn down by his illness to manage a full-scale inaugural event at the Capitol building. And of course, we know that less than three months after his fourth inaugural, the president would die of a massive cerebral hemorrhage. Vice President Harry Truman, who you can see on the left side of this photograph, would complete FDR's term of office. Now, that's a pretty sober note to end this program on, so I want to give you all an added bonus. We're going to leave my office here at the FDR library and move over to the museum's processing room, where I've assembled a few additional artifacts related to FDR's four inaugurals that you'll be able to see up close. Let's head over there now. So we're now in the museum's processing room. This is a room in the museum where the museum staff works with uh, collections. Uh, we work directly with them, getting them ready for display, uh, examining them for condition uh, requirements and, and any preservation work. Uh, so I've pulled out a few additional items that relate to FDR's four inaugurals. Um, to give you a closer look at some of these interesting pieces that we have in the collection. The very first item I want to point to is this metal sign. Uh, this sign, which reads, Emergency No Parking, uh, Midnight March 3rd to Midnight March 4th. This was a sign that actually was among the many signs that would have been put up in Washington, D.C. around the Capitol in advance of the inaugural ceremonies in 1933 when FDR was inaugurated for the first time. Uh, why do we have this sign? Well, uh, a dozen of FDR's uh, Hyde Park neighbors attended the inaugural and uh, on their way home, they commandeered this metal sign as a souvenir. And later, I don't think you can see it back here,
but they all signed the back of the sign uh, to prove that they were there on Inauguration Day, 1933. The second item I have here, actually the next two, are original cartoon art. Um, one of the things that we have in our collection uh, are original cartoons that were done, political cartoons by cartoonists during the Roosevelt era. Very often the cartoonists would donate them to uh, give them to the president or later after his death, donate them to the library. These two political cartoons uh, deal with the 1941 inaugural and the 1945 inaugural. They were both done by a political cartoonist named Carl Connect, who was with a newspaper in uh, Evanston, uh, Indiana. Um, and the first one, uh, you see FDR, uh, he's going through his inaugural parade. Uh, this is his third term, right, 1941. He's been elected to a third term. And you see the crowds on each side. And um, there's a sign down here in the corner that reads, his second ride both ways alone. And what does that mean? Well, traditionally, the president and the president-elect ride from the White House to the Capitol building for the inaugural ceremonies. Um, so when FDR was first inaugurated in 1933, he rode to the Capitol with uh, the sitting president, Herbert Hoover. And then after the ceremony, the president, the new president, just drives back to the White House alone. That's always been the tradition. Well, in this case, um, FDR's taking on his third term. He is the sitting president. So uh, the joke here is that it's the second time, both 1937 when he was elected the second time and now 1941, the third time, uh, that he's riding both ways, both to the Capitol and then back from the Capitol all by himself. The other cartoon is from the 1945 inaugural. And this was, of course, FDR's fourth inaugural. He'd been elected to a fourth term in 1944. And in this case, Connect has uh, FDR waving from the balcony of the White House. Remember I mentioned that the inaugural in 1945 was actually done uh, at the White House uh, rather than at the Capitol building. So he has FDR waving from there and uh, he's got his five fingers in his hand all the way out. And in the lower right, you can see uh, the cartoonist has written one, two, three, four. That little finger isn't wiggling, is it? He has the fifth finger wiggling, sort of indicating, is he going to run for a fifth term? The last thing I want to show you today are um, four medals that were created to uh, commemorate FDR's four inaugurals. There's a long tradition in American politics for uh, commemorative me medals being created for each presidential administration. It's something that goes all the way back to George Washington. Um, but the idea of official inaugural medals is more recent. Um, it really began with President William McKinley in 1901. Now, official inaugural medals are produced privately in limited numbers, and originally they were given to distinguished guests and uh, members of the inaugural committee. But over time, um, they've actually become uh, items that are sold um, to raise money to fund the inaugural uh, celebrations. Um, I've got all four of the official inaugural medals that were created for FDR's four inaugurals, and we're going to go through them one by one. Uh, the very first one is this one from 1933. This was designed by the distinguished sculptor Paul Manship. Um, uh, Manship, you might know, uh, designed the sculpture, for example, of Prometheus that you see in front of Rockefeller Center, among other things, and he actually later designed the inaugural medal for John F. Kennedy uh, for his inauguration in 1961. Um, on the front, we see FDR's uh, portrait. And then on the back side, we have a depiction of the USS Constitution, the famous old Ironsides of the early American Navy. And around it, we have a quotation that reads, Thou too sail on, O ship of state. Sail on, O union, strong and great. Uh, this is a quotation taken from uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem, uh, The Building of a Ship, which was a favorite of Franklin Roosevelt's. The next medal I'm going to show you is from the 1937 uh, inaugural. And uh, this one was designed by a Washington, D.C.-based sculptor named Joseph Anthony Atchison. Um, and on the front, we see FDR again. 
Um, and then on the back, actually, we have his vice president, John Nance Garner. Um, it's a tradition with these commemorative medals that if a president's elected to a second term, that uh, the vice president should be depicted on the medal as well. Our third example here is from, it's very small, but this, these are the size they did, uh, from the 1941 inaugural. Now for this one, the portrait of FDR that you see on the front uh, was done by the distinguished sculptor, Joe Davison. Uh, Joe Davison did a number of busts of Franklin Roosevelt during his presidency, and actually he and FDR became friends in the course of FDR's presidential years. Um, and uh, Davidson, uh, among other things, did the bust of FDR that you see at uh, Four Freedoms Park in New York City. It's, it's a very large uh, a bust that's uh, uh, really the focal point of that park in New York City. So he designed the front of this 1941 uh, commemorative uh, medal. The back, however, was designed uh, by another man, John Sinnock, who was the chief engraver of the United States Mint. So you really have two uh, individuals involved in the creation of this 1941 commemorative. Now we come to the last one, the, the medal struck for FDR's fourth inaugural in 1945. Um, again, Joe Davidson was the designer of the front of the medal. And here we have a depiction of FDR. Um, he's wearing his distinctive naval cloak, uh, the boat cloak, uh, that he wore very often, especially during World War II, and became very associated with his public image. Um, and so you see him depicted there. And then on the back, the reverse was again designed by uh, John Sinnock of the U.S. Mint. And here again we have, just like in the first inaugural, the USS Constitution depicted again. And um, the same quote uh, about uh, taken from Longfellow, uh, that rings the mill. So that brings us to the end of this program focused on items related to FDR's four inaugurals. I'll be back again soon to talk about the stories connected to other museum artifacts in our collection. If you want to learn anything more about the items featured in this program, I encourage you to take our virtual museum tour and explore our digital artifact collection. Both are available on the Library and Museum's website. See you next time.